there are simple tools that you can use that act like lifelines in your life. And those tools are meaningful mantras, temporary or uh, permanent tattoos, or there are ways that you can use even a simple post-it note as a environmental cue. That's what a researcher calls it. You can use a simple post-it note to act like a lifeline, to remind you that you have the power inside of you to face something. And in those moments where it really counts and you're trying to level up that, yes, you can show up in this moment and you can perform your best. And so while we're going to start with the tattoo story, which is a great story, um, we're going to get to a deeper topic here. And by the time you're done listening to this episode, you're going to have a phrase that you've identified that will act like a lifeline for you moving forward. And because I always say this is not just a listening podcast, it's a doing one, I'm going to ask you to do something specific and no, it's not to go get a tattoo. So on the topic of tattoos, (laughs) (laughs) if you have a tattoo or you know someone who does, you know that every tattoo has a story and mine uh, begins just a few weeks before our 15th wedding anniversary. Can you believe this? We've been married 26 years. So this would have been 11 years ago, right? 11 years ago. Yeah, 11 years ago. 11 years ago was 2012. And Chris, let's just set the table for everybody. Because 11 years ago, our life looked really different. 2012, you were still in the restaurant business. Mm. We were... 800 grand in debt. We were struggling with drinking issues and we were trying to make the ends meet. And we thought a tattoo was going to save us. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it would distract us. We we decided that on No, our, it was our anniversary. It was our right? anniversary. And so we decided that it would be cool if we got tattoos on the date of our 15th wedding anniversary. And Provided it wasn't the same tattoo. Well, see, this is the thing. I wanted to get matching tattoos. <laughs> I thought it would be super cool if you and I got the exact same tattoo on our 15th wedding anniversary. And what was your response? Never. Yeah, I think it was no fucking way. I, thought you, <laughs> I think you said that is so cheesy. We are bound for divorce if we get matching tattoos. We are not doing that. And so that was kind of my idea. And Chris just shot it out of the sky. Boom, not happening. And so we got- Do you remember what my reaction was to even getting? We had been talking about it maybe a little bit. I don't remember. Do you remember yours? Was it an out of the blue idea that, hey, let's do this for our anniversary? Or we had talked about it before? I think we had talked about how we both wanted to get one. And then we decided we'd get it for our 15th. And I thought we'd get matching. You said, absolutely not. And then all of a sudden we went into our corners- And we were individually thinking about our tattoos. And as the date of our anniversary, August 24th, came closer and closer, and to the appointment, uh, I started to panic because I had no idea what I wanted for my tattoo. And then all of a sudden, you guys, Chris walks into the room one day and says, I figured out what my tattoo is going to be. Why don't you tell him the story? Because I wanted to kill you when you told me what it was going to be. I grew up as a ski racer and was competing in races every weekend in my teenage years. And I was always that kid in the starting gate that was shaken like a leaf and worried about not the race, but the outcome. You know, I was I was in my head thinking about what was going to be my time and how it was going to line up. And, um, and my, would it freak you out? Yeah, I was always, it, it was always about the result. Yep. You know, the, the end game, if you will, for yep. me, or at least this was the observation that ultimately my dad had of me. And my dad was often at these races and he, he helped me see the racing and the course a little bit differently by constantly suggesting that I just take it one gate at a time Hmm. to just rather than think about the big picture or the end game, just one gate, one gate at a time. 
And along the years, my dad and I would converse about this without ever necessarily giving it a name of a philosophy, if you will. But he wrote a letter to me about it one day. And that was my, that was my wake up, my tattoo wake up call that I <laughs> decided to pull the handwriting off of a letter my dad authored about just taking things one gate at a time. And so that became, <laughs> that became <laughs> my tattoo idea. And, and so describe where it is and what it is. I put this tattoo on my forearm, on my left forearm, and I didn't necessarily have a vision for having it kind of be oriented such that I could read it really easily, but mm -hmm. ultimately it was the tattoo artist who suggested kind of the the right placement of it. But it's, yeah, it just says the word one and the word gate, one gate, written in my dad's ha handwriting. It's beautiful. And so being the shallow piece of shit that I am at times, when Chris uh, <laughs> announced that he had figured out his tattoo and that he was going to take his dead father's handwritten letter to a tattoo artist and have that tattoo artist lift those two words, one gate, in his father's handwriting and put it on his left forearm where he could see it and have as a reminder, I thought that is the best damn idea and now I have no idea what the hell I am going to tattoo on my body. That is so, I was so pissed and so jealous that you had such a good idea. And you guys, I freaked out and stressed out until the night before we were supposed to get tattoos. The night before we were going to go into this appointment, our 15th wedding anniversary, I still had no idea what I was going to put on my body. And then luckily, a friend of ours, who was one of my very first clients when I became a life coach, Deva, who owns the amazing store in Boston called Matsu, she stopped by to say hi. And we started talking about the tattoo. And I said, I have no idea what I want. She agreed. Chris's idea, that was a really good idea. Really good idea. And I, um, I didn't know Deva was the origin yeah, of this idea for you. Yeah. So what happened is I, I started saying, I, I don't know what to do with it. And she said, well, I know what it should be. And I'm like, you do? What should it be? And she said, it should say it shall be. I said, what? What, what, what do you mean it should say it shall be? She said, you say it all the time. I said, no, I don't. She said, yes, you do. I said, no, I don't. She said, Mel, you have coached me for years. You always say, if you put in the work, and you hold the belief that'll happen, at some point, it shall be. I had honestly never realized that I had used that phrase when coaching other people. And as she said it, in that way, it just kind of went clunk. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the words, it shall be, on the inside of my right wrist, and it will be both a reminder to me that if I do the work, if I have faith, if I keep my head down and if I give up my timeline, it shall be. It'll all work out. It'll be fine. And um, so that was that. Now, meanwhile, there's another twist to this story. Because do you remember what happened on our actual 15th wedding anniversary? <laughs> do I ever? That's the funniest <laughs> part of the whole story. Okay, well, tell everybody. Well, just that Mel had, Mel, you were in radio at the time, Yeah, right? it was when I was a radio host. So you guys, Chris was still in the restaurant business. So we she were had, struggling financially. She, had, she was doing some show in Boston and she had, it wasn't the tattoo artist. You had, you had had some show talking about tattoos, Correct. right? Correct. Throwback. And... Um, all these people called in. And they suggested like the best tattoo parlor in town. Correct. You, if you're going to get a tattoo, you have to go to this guy. Yes. And you, of course, took it upon yourself to book us the appointment, which was 
at that point had to have been six months out. Yes, and they had a huge wait list. So you couldn't even get in until yeah. like four months out. We booked this thing six months out, you guys. So you put down this for, big ass deposit for our anniversary. We have a babysitter. We're going into Boston. We got our appointment. <laughs> we're about to pull on the Mass Pike. And what happens? We're no, we're pulling out of the driveway, and you you're like, well, where are we where are we go? Let's get the address of this place. And then you said, well, let me just call them just to make sure, let them know we're coming. And you call them, and sure enough, the guy says, I don't know, we got you on the books for next week. <laughs> <laughs> and I start pleading with him. Oh no, no, you can't! I we made this six month. No, 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 no. It's next week. It's a week from today. But that's not our anniversary. I never would have screwed this up. This must be a mistake. Can you just fit us in now? No. And we were going away. We could like we couldn't even make the following. Yeah, week but the, also anyway. the thing was is it was supposed to be on the anniversary. Right. So now here we are with a babysitter. We have our tattoos. You've got your letter. I've got my phrase. We have no appointment. I start calling tattoo parlors because we decide let's just head into Boston. And I'm like, how hard could this be? Do you know the first five or six tattoo parlors that I called were booked? Like no openings. I didn't know you couldn't just walk into a tattoo parlor. Who the hell is getting all these tattoos? So I finally call the sixth or seventh place. And it was a place that was right around the corner from this apartment that we used to live in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when we first moved to Boston before we had kids for you to go to graduate school. And the guy answers the phone and he says, sure, come on in. And then he says, what's the name? And I say, Mel Robbins. And he goes, you mean from WTKK, Mel Robbins? I thought I recognized this voice. I love your show. My wife's a huge fan of yours. Come on in. It turned out to be a guy that listened to my old radio show. So we drive to this place. The guy is this amazing, big, bearded, teddy bear of a guy. He gives us this big old bear hug. Chris goes first because here's the next twist that happened. It had completely been lost on me that I hadn't even picked out a font or handwriting. And so I had the phrase, it shall be, but I had no idea what I wanted it to look like or how big it was going to be. So while Chris got his tattoo, I pulled up Microsoft Outlook. And I started going through the font choices and ended up picking the only font that looked somewhat cool, which turned out to be something called like Zaftigs or Dabdigs or Zad. It was like a Z. Printed it out on his printer. And that became what I permanently put on my body. And I was having like doubts and second guesses and Chris's looked so good. But I was just like, why didn't I think that I should have like, thought about the font it looks a little bit like your handwriting though so that's good it's a, it's yeah <clears throat> it's okay i mean it's fine i it's I, I love my tattoo i love my tattoo and so i've got these sort of curved uh it shall be right on my inside wrist and big hooky things and we'll we'll if you're watching this on youtube you can see it um we'll put it on the stories and the thing that i love about this and this is why it's so important for us to talk about meaningful mantras today and environmental cues that you can use to help you stay steady, to help you tap into that courage and that confidence and that power that's inside of you. And over the years, I can't tell you how many times I have looked at this tattoo. And these words, it shall be, they are a lifeline for me. You know, when I think about moments where I was failing at something, or life was going off the rails, I would see those words, it shall be. And I'd take a deep breath and I'd put my head down and I'd say, Mel, you just got to keep believing it's going to all work out. You got to keep putting in the work. If you're a good, kind person, it'll happen. Maybe not on your timeline, but just keep going. When times were tough, these three words, it shall be, reminded me that this is just a moment. And like all moments, this will pass. And now our puppy, homie, is like wanting to go to the bathroom. <laughs> it shall be. No, but it really, it, it, thinking about the question that Jonathan wrote in and saying how you're so intentional in everything mm. that you do, 
it was it was a very thoughtful question and and I would agree that your your application of that in life is very pronounced and interesting how you didn't necessarily see it like Deva saw it mm. and how <laughs> the only thing that was not intentional about it was the the scramble to get the right tattoo before the evening <laughs> itself. Well, you know what's great about this? Actually, I shouldn't say that because you booked the appointment. We had it on the anniversary. Like we were, we were, we were organized. Yeah. We were ready to roll. There you was know intentionality. What I like, the entire story of the tattoo is a demonstration of the philosophy it shall be. Because none, of, nothing went according to plan, and yet we just took it one gate at a time. <laughs> and I was fierce in my belief that it was all just going to work out. What are the odds that the appointment is on the wrong date or that the first five places I call are not available for appointments, but the one that is happens to be a guy that listened to my little local Saturday radio show and recognized my name and voice? Like, it's just a little bit of optimism that acts like a lifeline for me. And it reminds me that it's gonna work out, that I have the power within me to face things. That's how I've been using this phrase, it shall be over the last 11 years, because these have not been the easiest 11 years of our life. I would argue some of the hardest. The hardest, for sure. I mean, when I think about the state that you were in when you left the restaurant business just two years after I got this tattoo and you just checked out of life, you're like, I'm getting sober, I have to heal, I have to take care of myself. And for two years, you were just comatose. And I'm like in survival mode. And I would look at this, my tattoo, it shall be, it shall be. And it gave me faith that if I just kept working hard, we'd figure it out that we'd figure out how to pay the bills, that I would figure out how to build this business, that you would figure out how to heal and find your way back to yourself and to me. And even things like moving up here to Southern Vermont and how hard that was and feeling like I've just turned my whole life upside down. And yet there was this deeper knowing that drove our decision to move and to change our life profoundly from living outside of Boston to being in this tiny rural town. And on those days that I just felt so lost, I would look at my wrist and go, it shall be. It's going to work out. Like, I can do this. And even with the podcast, everybody was like, you know how crowded that is. You know how oh, there's five million podcasts. I was like, you know what? I'm playing the long game. I'm not. I'm. I'm. It shall be. I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to go for it. And and I even feel that like when our kids are struggling, like it just it 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 helps me. This phrase, it shall be, to put almost like a beacon out in the future. It's a reminder that at some point, the road ahead is easier, and great things happen and it gives me faith to keep going i think the location of that tattoo is also properly aligned with you and your own just being reminded of that right because if you had that tattoo on the back of your shoulder i'd never you, see it where you weren't seeing it all day every day you would always wanted to put it right something whatever it was you were thinking well why get a tattoo and hide it right you know i will tell you what i do want everyone to do I do want you to take us passing you the mic very seriously. And I want you to try the power of creating a meaningful mantra or a word or a phrase that you can turn to every day. And I do want you to get a post-it note or a piece of painter's tape or something that you can write your phrase, word, or mantra that's meaningful to you on it. And... Let's take it a step further. I'd love to see these. I believe in you is a good one. I believe in you. 
I believe in you. For years, though, that probably, well, if I think about it from me in the present moment, it wouldn't sink because there have been plenty of moments where I didn't believe in myself. Mm -hmm. But if I think about it as a message from the future Mel, the person I'm becoming, as if she was saying to me, I believe in you, Mel, and I know what's coming, and that's why I believe in you. That would go, ooh, I love that. That's really, maybe that'll be my next tattoo. But it's interesting how you describe that as though it's something outside of you or a voice or something mm -hmm. external. Mm -hmm. Like I don't think of one gate as like I don't hear my dad talking to me per se. Like I don't see my dad all the time. I think of it whereas what you were just describing is some larger voice, which is profound and and can be powerful, but it's uh, it conjures up a visual. It shall be as a larger voice for me. Yeah. It is. And so I would love to see your meaningful mantra, and I'd love to see you. So take a photo of you and your Post-it note or you and your Sharpie and share your phrase or word or mantra and tag me, Mel Robbins, tag the podcast, the Mel Robbins podcast, you might even be featured on our social media channels, but mostly I just want to see you and give you a virtual hug and a high five. And um, I want to get inspired by you. Speaking of meaningful mantras that you say to yourself, there's something I want to be sure to say to you. In case nobody else tells you this today, I wanted to tell you that I love you. I love you too. And I believe in you. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to create a life that you love, one gate at a time. And if you do, it shall be. <laughs> oh, let's go get tattoos. <laughs> it's your friend Mel, and you and I are sitting here, and I was just confessing to you that I did a whole worry spiral this morning, and I'm teaching you one of my favorite tools, the six-sentence word, what if it all works out. We need to know that it is painful to stand there and be terrified that you're going to uh, not be able to say goodbye to somebody that you love because you're scared of flying and now you're sitting in an airplane seat. And when you say to yourself, what if it all works out? You know what it's like? It's like, okay, life just fired an arrow at you and I want you to stop and think right now, okay? What is an arrow that life fired at you? And think about something going on in your life right now and in order to get you thinking about this, I'm going to bring in our global audience because I knew I wanted to talk about this. So we put up something on Instagram real quick and you guys respond like, oh my gosh, moths to a flame. It's incredible. I love you. And I asked, what would your life be like if you didn't worry about anything? And what are you worrying about right now? And so let me tell you some of the arrows that life is throwing at people. Um, I'm scared of flying. This is Sylvia. And um, I always worry because I feel out of control that I'm going to die on the plane flight. And here's the second arrow. You ready? That she's firing. What if I can't say goodbye? What if this is it? That's the second arrow. It's fine to be afraid of flying, but why are you torturing yourself with all these horrible thoughts? Instead, I want you to reach up and grab that second arrow that you're aiming at yourself with your worries in midair. I want you to yank it out of the air by going, what if it all works out? What if this plane lands? What if I not only get to see all these people that I love and say goodbye, but I'm the last one standing in my family. I outlive them all. What if it all works out? Here's another one. Maggie, annual reviews are coming up. Mm -hmm. Boom, that's an arrow in the heart. That's the first arrow. It is nerve wracking. That's true. But why does Maggie need to go, what if I get fired? What if I'm the one that gets laid off? What's going to happen to my kids? How am I going to pay for groceries? That is the second arrow. 
That's why you need. What if it all works out? You reach up, you grab it, you grab it, you grab it, you grab it. Here's another one. Here's a really, really important one from Gabby. I'm going through a divorce. Boom, arrow straight to the heart. Even when you know it's the best thing, it's still painful, isn't it? That's what happens in your life. But the second arrow, what if I never, ever have the life that I actually want? You got to stop that shit from hitting your head. You got to stop firing that stuff right at yourself. That's why you got to reach up with these six words. What if it all works out? What if it all works out? What if getting divorced is painful, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me? What if this divorce is really challenging right now, but I'm going to emerge stronger and a better version of myself and my kids are going to be better and that's going to open the door to me being in a healthier, more supportive relationship? What if this is the best thing that ever happened to me, even though it's the hardest thing that ever happened to me? Isn't that awesome? This is how you stop firing that second arrow at yourself. Here's another one. There are natural disasters in the news all the time in the area that I live in. That's an arrow. Every time you see a natural disaster. But why do you have to fire the second one at yourself? What if the mudslide takes out my house? What if the volcano erupts here? What if the floods come and they wipe out that thing? It hasn't happened yet. So why on earth are you causing yourself this pain? I'll tell you why. Because we're used to doing it. This is what we do reflexively. Life fires an arrow and then we fire the second one. And so this is why what if it all works out isn't just putting lipstick on a pig or icing a shitty situation over with some like positive gloss. This is actually using science to combat your shitty habits of torturing yourself. This is you intervening with logic because if something bad hasn't happened, how does worrying about it help you right now? If you don't know what's actually going to happen, how does worrying about it or assuming the worst case going to make things better? It's not. In fact, you experience the pain twice because you experience the anticipation of it. And let's just say you are going to get fired. And look, I've been fired twice. I have been literally brought into somebody's office and told I'm doing a terrible job and let go. It is the worst. And then the second you leave, once you get over the humiliation of the whole thing, it's the most liberating thing that ever happens to you because you typically only get fired from a job that you can't stand anyway or that you know that you're not performing in, which is the case. But I knew it was coming. I just could feel it. I tortured myself for a month. I didn't need to do that because it didn't change the outcome. If anything, it made me experience it over and over and over. And I'll tell you, anticipating it, way worse than what actually happened. If I had just said to myself for those 30 days, what if it all works out, Mel? What if you do get fired and it's the best thing that ever happened? What if uh, you're not going to get fired, but this is a wake-up call for you to step it up and actually start performing a little bit better? It allows you to stop experiencing so much pain. Actually, yesterday, I, I, I did this before I flew to Salt Lake because I was racing around the house. I couldn't find my freaking computer charger. I couldn't find my passport. I couldn't find the bag that I normally put my travel equipment in. And I was racing around. I was freaking out. I was like, oh, my God, I, I only have 15 minutes before I got to go. What if I don't find the And I was like, Mel, stop. What if it all works out? What if you suddenly find the charger? Or better yet, you're an adult. You can get to an airport and buy a charger. So instead of literally firing arrows at yourself, you could stop firing it and focus. And that's why this is super, super important. I'm going to talk about the other reason why it's critical that you not escalate situations with this unnecessary worrying, okay? Here, let me give you some other ones from our audience. Um, oh, Natalie. Anytime I see somebody else happy, Boom, arrow to the heart. That's what's happening around you. Then she fires a second one. What if I'm never going to find my person? Does worrying about that help you find your person? No. It actually makes you feel more insecure. And this is where I want to go next because here's the thing. There is a profound connection between catastrophizing and aiming these arrows at yourself and the pain that you feel and how it impacts your ability to problem solve to think clearly, 
This all comes from research out of UCLA from Dr. Judith Willis. I wrote about this extensively for my research in the High Five Habit book. We interviewed Dr. Judith Willis for that book and dug into her research. And she is pioneering all of this research around the connection between your nervous system and the ability for you to do what's called executive function. Executive function is basically the frontal lobe, the prefrontal cortex part of your brain, your forehead, basically, for those of us uh, kind of everyday people. It's your ability to problem solve. It's your ability to make strategic decisions. It's your ability to think clearly. When you start aiming that second arrow, my daughters must have fallen off a cliff. I haven't heard from her. Something terrible has happened. I'm going to get fired. I'm never going to be happy again. I'm never going to get this weight off. And the pain and the pain and the pain that comes with doing that to yourself, it sets off the alarm, the fight or flight or freeze part of your nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, it's called. And when the alarm nervous system is going off, it impairs the cognitive functioning in your brain. It impacts decision making. It impacts your ability to focus. It impacts your ability to problem solve. And so you're not only firing a second arrow at yourself, which causes so much pain, you are also firing that arrow right into the center of your forehead. And it impacts your ability to think clearly, to solve a problem. And here's why this is important. Let's just say for those of you that are really skeptical and you're like, but yeah, but, but, but Mel, what if something bad does happen? What if, what if your daughter did fall off of a cliff and she's laying there with a broken clavicle and, and she needs help? I'll tell you what, if I don't hear from her in 72 hours, I need to move into problem solving mode, right? Is it going to help me solve a problem halfway around the world if I've shot an arrow into the center of my forehead and I've worked myself into such a state that I can't think clearly? Uh, no. And so even if the worst case scenario that you're terrified about happens, your ability to face it, to problem solve through it, to think clearly about your options, it is severely impaired by this constant worrying that you are doing. And that's why this is so important. What if it all works out? It doesn't guarantee that it will. It guarantees that you will stay calm, that you will stay focused, that you will stay present, and that you will stay positive until you know otherwise. And that's everything. All right, I'm going to hit the pause real quick. I got to run to the bathroom because I have a feeling that I'm going to be talking to you right up until the time I got to race out of this hotel room to go give a speech. Don't go anywhere. I got more that I want to share with you, including a lot of really cool research. Stay with me. Welcome back. It's your pal, Mel. And we're talking about the six words that I use that magically just, boom, silences the worry spiral and my anxiety. What if it all works out? Okay. And another thing I'm going to confess to you is that until I stumbled on this, what if it all works out? I didn't realize how much I was doing this to myself. I basically walked around life with a second arrow in my head because I was constantly worried about something, constantly thinking something bad was going to happen. And, you know, some of the experts that we've had on this podcast that talk about trauma or talk about the impact of growing up in a chaotic household or experiencing abuse or being the kind of person that felt like as a kid, you were always waiting for the other shoe to drop. You were super hyper vigilant. This is very, very common for people like us. That is me, Miss looking around the corners, what, 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 what is the bad thing that's going to happen, anticipating things. And what I'm here to tell you is that if you start to really lean into what I'm talking about, which is how you aim the second arrow at your forehead and you start utilizing, well, what if it all works out to grab the second arrow, yank it out of your forehead and be present in the moment and not escalate things until necessary. You can still tap into your intuition. You can still look around corners which is a superpower for you. But you don't have to add on the pain that all of the negative thoughts are creating. And there's so much research about this. First of all, stress can actually lead to physical pain. Mm -hmm. It comes from Dr. Arthur Barsky, who's a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, where they've done these studies uh, about how stress can lead to physical pain. And let me tell you something, when you start 
allowing yourself to worry. I'm not going to get into college. Uh, I'm not going to be finding love uh, after my spouse has died, or I'm never going to get this weight off, or I'm not going to get control of this. When you start doing that to yourself, it does cause physical pain. And you know this. How many times have you been so stressed out or worried that you get a headache? Or you've been worried before a test and you get nauseous, don't you? Or you start shaking or your stomach is twisting a nuts. That's why we say twisting a nuts because that's what it feels like. It's physical pain. And a lot of times it begins from your nervous system getting triggered. That's the first arrow. And the second arrow is your thoughts. So they've done all of this interesting research. And what they have been able to prove in studies is that the neural pathways in your brain that indicate physical pain, the same ones light up when you have a painful thought. And it is painful to think that you're never going to be happy. It is painful to think you're not going to see your loved ones again. It is painful to think that you're never going to achieve your dreams or that you're never going to amount to something. That's why I want you to stop it. Scientists have also done this really interesting study where they looked at math anxiety. So math anxiety is literally just feeling stressed out and worried when you're about to do math problems. And the anticipation of doing math prompts a similar brain reaction as when you experience pain. And the researcher, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and the leading expert on math anxiety, said that it is the equivalent of burning one's hand on a hot stove. And I love knowing this research because it allows you to stop and go, huh, it is true. Because it is painful. It's painful to think these thoughts. And that's why I want you to really steal these six words for me. What if it all works out? I also want you to steal this Buddhist teaching and proverb that when misfortune or stress or something doesn't meet your expectations or something painful happens in your life, that is the first arrow. Hits you right in the heart. But the second arrow is the one that you fire back at yourself into the center of your forehead based on what you think about what just happened. And that's the piece that you have control over. Yes, you will always think negative thoughts, but you don't have to escalate it. You don't have to stay there. And you can use these six words, what if it all works out, and logic to pause that spiral and to question your thinking. And when you question yourself, well, what if it all works out? The fact is, it just might, right? Like, you don't know. You haven't even entertained that possibility because you've been so busy firing arrows at your forehead, you didn't even stop to think, well, there's a whole different possibility here. And based on the research of Penn State, 91% of the time, that's the possibility. So what the hell am I all worked up about? Because getting worked up, as we know, based on the research at UCLA and from Dr. Judith Willis, it doesn't help me. And... Here's the final piece. I believe in you. And I believe in your ability to face the things that are painful in your life. And I also believe in your ability to problem solve and to rise to these moments where life is painful and life is challenging. And if something bad is going to happen, I want you to not face it with an arrow in your head. I want you to have your full capacity to think clearly, to ask for help, to solve whatever issue is happening in your life. And that's why this is also important. It's because between now and whenever something amazing or something terrible happens in your life, you have the ability to be more present and to assume good intent and assume a positive outcome. And that is going to help you both enjoy your life, but it's also going to help you face things if they do in fact turn out to be hard, which we know based on the research is about 6% of the time. Those are odds I'm willing to play with. I'm willing to play with those odds. I'm willing to bet that things are okay. I'm willing to bet on you and me and our ability to be more positive, to be more optimistic, to be more trusting, and to live in that space until we know otherwise. Doesn't that sound like a good idea? I think it does too. When you train yourself to reach up and grab that second arrow before it hits your forehead, because you don't know. You don't know. 
So you might as well coach yourself to think something positive will happen. You might as well learn how to default to positive ideation, where you say, this could be the best thing that ever happens to me. This isn't easy, but I trust that I'm going to grow through it. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think I can figure it out. This is more difficult than I thought it would be, but boy, am I proud of myself for doing this. When you can default to positive ideation, I haven't heard from her in two days. She must be having the time of her life. I haven't heard from her in two days, but I saw that sunrise, which means she's probably so busy with all the friends she made up there because she was also taking photos of other people up there. Uh, she must be so busy. She didn't have time to talk to her mother. And wouldn't that be the most amazing thing that could happen if you went on a four-month solo backpacking trip as a 24-year-old woman to be so caught up in the moment that you don't have time to check in at home? Boy, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? And that's what I am telling myself because that's what I believe is true. And research shows that getting your mind to focus on positive thoughts, positive outcomes, visualizing, hey, what would it look like if this all works out? Scientists call this positive ideation. It is so effective in beating down that worry. So I want you to try it. Because, hey, what if you use these six words and it all works out? That would be a beautiful thing. You have this incredible family motto that you, I would love for every family to adopt this, but can you share it with us? Um, so in our family, we have a mantra, which is to never worry alone. And that's true of us as parents and also of our kids. And what I what I hope to instill in my kids with that mantra is the idea that we are worthy of support. We are worthy of being held and nurtured and, um, and supported when we are having setbacks. We are not our setbacks. Our worth is our worth. And when we worry with others, we feel validated. We hear our worth. We see it in the support that others give us. We get that social proof that we are valued no matter what. Hmm. Whatever you do, don't don't worry alone. That's when we get into trouble. So reach out for support. We think as parents, our job is to raise self-reliant, independent adults. And that is an important thing to do. But there is a more profound lesson that our kids need to learn if we want to raise them to be healthy. And that is the skills of interdependence, how to rely on others and how to have others rely on them in healthy ways. And so that's where the don't worry alone comes from, is part of the skills that I'm trying to teach my kids of interdependence. Oh, wow. That's so important. You're right. And we do focus on kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and being self being self-reliant and taking responsibility, that modeling healthy connection and interdependence, getting support when you need support, talking about your feelings, that we got to model that too. And if you're not, you're teaching somebody to suffer in silence the way that so many of us have for generations. One other thing that I love that you wrote about was uh, this idea that being good enough is way better than being perfect. Why is that? Yes. So I talk about this in the book that um, when my oldest was born almost 18 years ago, I thought about going back to graduate school to get a PhD in psychology so that I could be the perfect parent with the latest research. And <laughs> oh I know, crazy, right? Yes. And what I found is that perfection as a parent does not serve me and it does not serve my kids. What serves us both better is this idea of being good enough. And the good enough mother is responsive to her kids' needs. She doesn't meet every need because she can't. Only, you know, no one can. But to be responsive, to acknowledge it, to validate the need, and to do the best that you can do. And that takes us off the hook as parents, not needing to be perfect. And it helps our kids, you know, regulate their emotions when they get a little bit disappointed and frustrated that they can't have the perfect parent in this situation. It reminds me of this thing that you wrote that the difference between getting a 91% on a test and a 99 is having a good life. <laughs> that is it. 
that is it. And, uh, you know, as parents, I, I certainly fell into this trap myself. The idea that we had to put our needs behind our kids at every turn. And I certainly subscribe to that idea of needing to be the perfect mother. And then I realized that I was getting burnt out. And I would say the thing that really changed my mind about all of this is the research. The number one intervention for any child in distress is to make sure the primary caregiver, most often the mother or the father, that their well being, their mental health is intact because a child's resilience rests fundamentally on their caregiver's resilience. And caregiver's resilience rests fundamentally on the depth and support of their relationships. I want to make sure everybody heard that. You're saying that based on the research, if there is a child that is struggling, the most important intervention that works to help the struggling child is to give the caregiver of that child deeper levels of support. Yes. If you're somebody that's listening to us right now and you're like, Jenny Mel, that sounds great, but I don't have anybody or I don't even know where to start or who the hell am I gonna ask because everyone that I know is also burnt out you have a framework for this. So can you lay it out for everybody listening? Sure. So this is a, a study that was originally started by Sonia Luthar, one of the leading researchers in the world on resilience. And she did a series of studies, including people who were busy mothers and also had a busy professional life. And she wanted to find out if one hour a week for three months, one hour a week with a small group of four to five people in the same sort of kind of world, if they could be sources of support for each other. And what she found was no mother bowed out, even when the busyness, you know, of their, of their professional and, and home lives were calling for them. One hour of the week, they met, they talked about their struggles. And at the end of it, she measured their cortisol levels. Those had lowered. She me measured well-being relationships with their kids and relationships with their parents. And what she found was that you only need one hour of deliberate support a week, one hour. And for those of you going, but I don't know where to get it. Uh, churches have free daycare and they have a lot of support groups. That would be a great place to start. Community centers, looking in your town's Facebook pages for events that are going on. You're not going to find it sitting on your couch complaining to yourself about it. You're going to have to put yourself out there. You also say it's critical that we tell our kids and our colleagues and our friends our failure stories. What does that mean? So my daughter was in seventh grade and she considered herself a good writer. And her seventh grade teacher, you know, gave her her paperback and it had red marks all over the place. So she was so discouraged. And I said, Caroline, come to my computer. And I pulled up an early article I had written for the Washington Post science section. And it was edited by a really seasoned, wonderful editor. And it was a bloodbath. I mean, there were comments. There was, I don't understand this. Can you add more here? I need another interview. Where is this study? Where? And my daughter was like, oh my God, I can't believe they let you write for them. And I've been writing for them for 10 years now. And uh -huh. I said, see, at first I was embarrassed. I told her to need all that work to see all those red marks. And then I thought about it a different way. I said, oh, this person is trying to invest in me. They are trying to make me a better writer. So I now, t I welcome feedback is what I said to my daughter. You know, I sometimes even say out loud to myself in my office, well, that's enough for the day. Like <laughs> just that, because I, I, I have a tendency to overwork. And so I have to put the brakes on myself. And I want to model that out loud to my kids. You have a nicer way of saying, I'm always like, well, I just fucked up again. <laughs> and then they're like, mom, dollar in the swear jar. I'm like, I'm going to be paying for your college tuition with the amount I'm swearing around here because I screw up all the freaking time. Today, we're talking about a mindset reset, which is when you identify the default programming in your mind. You know, that critical voice that's constantly chirping away in the background. You're never good enough. You didn't get it right. You look fat. Once you identify that and that you're sick of it, how can you erase that bully and program a new positive soundtrack in its place? Well, Diane is about to help you do just that. Hi. How you doing? 
I'm great. How are you? I'm doing all right. Doing all right. I do have a question for you. I mean, wonderful information from Poppy. My question comes more of what about when this kind of programming and voices are from spouses, friends, employers, you know, and they're just basically building on what your parents or other people have said. Great question. So the question is, what if you've got programming from childhood that now is basically being reinforced by colleagues, bosses, spouses, friend group, blah, bitty, blah, bitty, blah. What is the kind of default negative thing that you say to yourself? It's definitely not good enough. And who the heck do you think you are? Ooh, the who the heck do you think you are? That has a real bite to it. Um, yes, it does. Yeah, it does. So um, I don't know why I'm going to ask you this, but I'm going to ask you this. Were either of your parents on the narcissism personality disorder by chance? <laughs> Spectrum? Well, I'm pretty close. I would say yes, one of them for sure. And the reason why I say that is because the who do you think you are has a very um, hostile nature to it. So I would imagine, and again, I'm just guessing, just guessing here, that (laughs) there was a level of either hostility or fighting or outbursts or eruptions that were very chaotic for you when you were a little kid happening with the adults in your house. I've blocked out a lot. I, I remember more of my adulthood where I, my ex was a narcissist. I okay. Mean, you know, definitely. Yep. Okay. So I am not surprised that you blocked a lot of childhood out because what happens is that when you're in a situation that is extremely stressful as a young kid because the adults around you can't be trusted or they're erratic, or whatever the situation may be, you live in a state of fight or flight, and the alarm system in your body is going off. And when you are on edge, and the alarm system in your nervous system is going off, because you don't feel safe around the adults in the house, it impairs the cognitive functioning in your brain. This comes from research out of UCLA. Dr. Judith Willis has studied extensively how nervous system dysregulation impacts the brain's ability to function. And so if you're busy managing this toxic stress in your body as a kid, your brain's not actually present to make memories. And so super normal to not have a lot of memories, by the way. I do not have a lot of memories from my childhood, from high school, from college, from law school, because I was in a constant state of anxiety. Never present in the room to make memories there. And Mm -hmm. what I want to tell you first is the good news. So the good news is, even though you have been the victim of being with a narcissist, and you have had a childhood that was fraught with all kinds of stuff, you can change your brain. You can learn how to calm your nervous system. And you can absolutely change the programming in your mind. And I want you to relate to the programming in your mind as if it was deliberately put there. Because even though Mm -hmm. a narcissist or somebody with a narcissistic personality is not deliberately doing this to you, they are so incapable of empathy, they're not even considering you and me. We're objects. They're just doing what they're doing, but we literally get damaged in the way that we think about ourselves when you're around somebody like that, because you think you're the problem. You think Mm -hmm. that if there was something different about you, then everything would be okay. And lots of people with a narcissistic personality issue, they actually tell you that you're the problem. And so this was a deliberate programming in your mind at the hands of of other adults. Now, the good news is you're an adult and you can 
take deliberate steps to reprogram your mind. And I'm going straight for like boom in the face on this because I want you to realize that you got to get deliberate about this. That mm -hmm. somebody else trained you to think this way. And it is a level of being deliberate. As if I said, you're going to move to Russia and you got to speak fluent Russian. I realize you've spoken, how old are you? 65. You've sp spoken English for 65 years. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of your life, we're going to speak Russian. We're going to okay. speak Swahili. We're going to speak a different language. <laughs> And you can learn a different language. And learning to shut off the abusive voice in your head and teaching yourself through thought sub substitution a different language is what you're going to have to do. So that's number one. Number two. You're not going to overnight be able to look in the mirror like, I love myself. It doesn't work that way because no. you've had a lifetime of people telling you otherwise. And your brain will reject any mantra that you choose that you have actively tried to disprove. Mm -hmm. And so we got to pick something for you that you may not quite be there yet, but you believe in the truth of it. And mm -hmm. what I believe that everybody deserves. I think you can say, I deserve to be happy or I'm a good person who's trying her best and I deserve to be happy. I'm a kind person who deserves respect. I am doing the best I can and that's good enough. Like there are these mantras that kick the narcissist, you're not good enough, who do you think you are thing out of your head and you can say something back that's like, hey, I'm a kind person, I'm doing the best I can, and that's good enough. And that is enough of a rebuke, and it's believable enough, even when you're beaten down, that as you repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it to yourself, because you're going to have to, you will start to believe it. And one final thing that I wanted to say to you is that, you know how you said that the programming started with my parents and then it was an ex and then it was colleagues and then it was a boss and it was this. That may be true, but we've also got to start to do the work of catching the filter in your brain. So yes, your boss may be a, an erratic douche who calls out the things that are negative or is always in a grouchy mood, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean anything about you. This is where your filter and the programming in your mind scans the world and reads your boss's crappy mood as having to do with you because mm -hmm. the narcissist in your life made you feel like everything was your fault. For all you know, mm -hmm. your boss's wife is having an affair. He's going through a tumultuous divorce. He's dealing with like some issue in his gut and he has irritable bowel syndrome, which is why he's always grouchy. And he's a really sad sack guy who can't get his shit together because he has childhood trauma, none of which has to do with you. Mm -hmm. But your programming in your mind makes you think everything's your fault. And that's also the part of the work that you're going to need to do. You got to reprogram the words you say. Hey, I'm a kind person. I'm doing the best I can. That's good enough. Or I deserve to be happy, especially after these assholes that were in my life. You can put a little sauce in there. Like, you know, you can tell I like a little spicy mantra, like something that, you know, because <laughs> if you don't quite believe it, if it doesn't like loosen you up a little bit, that's not the right thing to say. Because most mantras are bullshit because people pick things like, I love myself. And then they spend the day going, you look like shit. You screwed that. Like, no, you don't love yourself. I need to give myself a break. I'm doing the best I can. Now, there's a mantra I can get behind because I believe that. And so pick something believable. Put a little edge or fun into it because it shakes the mood down a little bit. And then go to work on this filter that you have of making everything is your fault because it's freaking not. Your stupid parents and your dumb ex-husband, all of whom were mentally challenged with narcissistic personalities, made you think that horseshit. You're not to blame for that, but you have a responsibility 
to change the way you talk to yourself and to basically go, not everything's about me. Thank God. <laughs> I love that you're laughing now. You seem lighter. What did you get out of this? I, I love the, the one thing. It's not everything's about me, period. It's not, it's not mine. Not always, not all of it, you know, and really retraining the brain, really working through catching those filters, you know, and it's going to have to be one step at a time. That's it. And, and here's the, give yourself a fucking break. Seriously. Give yourself a break. Like have a little bit of compassion. Wow. I got out of a marriage with a raging narcissist. I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> Yes, I am. Yes, you are. Yes, I am. Give yourself more credit. And, you. you know, it is true. Like, we get so focused on our own bullshit that we convince ourselves that the world's problems are our doing. Most people mm -hmm. have so much stuff going on and are so busy beating themselves up, they're not even thinking about you and me. Uh, yeah. All right. You new got mantra. this. You got yeah. this. Uh, let me hear you say your new mantra. Well, quit taking myself so seriously. I'm not getting out of this thing alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. This ends the same. And and how about adding, I might as well enjoy the rest of the ride. There we go. I may as well enjoy yeah. the rest of the ride. The first 65 kicked my ass. So let's have some fun the next <laughs> 65. <laughs> and they did. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, but you're here <laughs> laughing about it. That's more than most can say. And so... I do believe the best days of your life are on the road ahead. I believe that. Thank you. I'm, I'm believing it too. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting there. Awesome. Well, you know, I'm here. I'll be kicking your ass forward the whole way. Good. Let's go. All right. <laughs> go get them. Awesome. Thank you. You're awesome. You're Great question. Day. If you were listening to that and you felt it deep in your body somewhere, I want you to know that when you have the revelation that the voice that you've listened to for years, the voice that's held you back, that made you feel like shit, that it's actually not even yours. That can make your heart seize for a minute. It's kind of one of those like, wait, wait, what? And then when I add on top of it, that you're not to blame for the crap that somebody programmed into your head. You were just a little person with three pounds of macaroni that was trying to absorb everything around it. And our brains love patterns and it picks up on patterns of speaking. And... That's what your brain did. And so if you're having this revelation, holy shit, I've thought that everything's my fault for my entire life because somebody made me believe it was. And then I held on to that belief. Don't freak out. This is great news because so many people spend their entire lives not even realizing that it's possible to change the way you think. It is possible to put a new playlist in your mind. It is possible to filter the world completely differently and to make your brain work for you. Now, are you going to have positive thoughts all day long? No. Are you going to be like, you know, a thousand percent confident? No. But can you stop torturing yourself? Yes. Can you start encouraging yourself? You better believe you can. Can you separate what your narcissistic piece of shit ex-spouse said to you from what you actually believe about yourself? That you want to believe about yourself? Yeah, you can. Can you do it overnight? No. You're going to have to work at this just like the people in your past worked over time at saying things to you that beat you down. This stuff takes hold over time. But the good news is your brain is super responsive. 
And when you combine what you're learning about resetting your mind with healing your nervous system and the science of making and sticking to new habits, all of which you are absolutely smart enough and capable enough to apply to your life because your friend Mel Robbins, I am not going to make this scientific. I'm going to give you the science so that you know this stuff works and you can count on it and trust it. But I make this stuff so dead simple that literally your kids and I can do it. And so you can do everything that you are learning on the Mel Robbins podcast. You can change your mind. You can kick the bully out of your head. You can program in new thoughts. You can actively work to change the reticular activity system in your brain, that network of neurons that filters the world. You can take better care of your brain. And taking care of your physical brain will also help the thoughts in your mind. You can develop new healthy habits using the three simple aspects of a habit based in science and focusing on triggers and rewards. And you can do this. You can make it easier. And you can heal your nervous system, which is the trifecta of transformation. We hit the habits, the mindset, and the nervous system. Holy shit, you're like the terminator of transformation. You could do anything. I, I believe that. I just have way too much evidence to the otherwise. And if you're cynical about that, take a look at who, who taught you to be cynical. Just because life hasn't worked out for you the way that you wanted to up until this point, who fucking says it's not going to work out for you and the best days aren't ahead? I'll tell you who says you do. You decide whether or not you're going to continue to let all this crap you're not responsible for to hold you back or you're going to take responsibility for what happens next. Heal your nervous system. You can do that and you don't have to spend a dollar. Change your mind. You can do that and you don't have to spend a dollar to do it. Make new habits. Habits that actually help you get what you want, what you deserve. You can do that and you do not have to spend money to do it. So I just wanted to check in on you because there's a lot going on right now. I was sitting at my desk yesterday and I got the news that Stephen Twitch boss had died from suicide. And if you have not seen this news or you don't know who he is, let me just kind of share a little bit about him and why it impacted me. Um, so he was best known, and this is how I knew him, for being one of the executive producers of Ellen DeGeneres' talk show. And he was not only an executive producer, he was on that show every single day, five days a week. He was the DJ. He would do all the dance parties with Ellen. He has this huge, amazing megawatt smile and his energy. He's just one of those people that you didn't need to know him to know that <clears throat> literally positivity, dancing, spreading like kindness. That's what this guy was all about. And you didn't need to know him to, to know that he was also all about his wife, Allison, and his three like gorgeous kids. And during the pandemic, not only was he there with Ellen, but he and his wife, who are both dancers, started doing all of these choreographed awesome videos that went viral online. And they spread so much joy for people doing these dances and teaching people with their kids all these dance moves. And they just were this positive, amazing force. And so when I heard the news that he died from suicide yesterday at the age of 40, it just rocked me to my core. And I'm still processing it like 18 hours later. And when I woke up this morning, I also saw that I had missed the fact that yesterday was the 10th anniversary of Sandy Hook. And so I just felt this need to grab my coffee and to run up here. I haven't even washed my face yet this morning and talk to you. And I just wanted to share what I'm thinking and feeling 
because I think it's really important that in moments like this, where the news feels overwhelming or the world feels overwhelming, and I know the holidays can just bring up a lot of stuff for a lot of us too, I want to check in on you. And I want to check in on myself. And so that's why I decided I'm just going to get on this mic and I'm going to just talk to you and that's it. That's what we're doing today. So first things first, let's unpack or I want to share with you what I'm thinking in the wake of learning that somebody that was so light and positive and amazing on the outside, how do you process that kind of news? that they died from suicide. And notice the word I'm using. I'm saying died from suicide. And that's because I think about a death from mental health struggles the same way I think about a death from cancer. Like if you have a friend that dies of brain cancer, you say they died from cancer. If you have a friend or a loved one, as every single one of us does, who has died from a struggle with addiction or depression or trauma or toxic stress or any other mental health issue, that mental health challenge deteriorated the physical structure of that person's brain. That's what happened. The same way that brain cancer physically deteriorates the brain until it kills somebody. And so the word choice is really deliberate because it's a recognition of what actually happened. There's a couple other bigger things that I just have to say, and that is that you don't, you don't need to know somebody. Like you don't need to know Twitch personally to be affected personally by the news of his death. You don't have to have lived in the Sandy Hook community to be impacted by the news that it was the 10th anniversary yesterday. Because these things that are happening out in the world trigger you to remember experiences of loss in your own life. And so for me personally, I think one of the reasons why I have been so rocked by this news is because, you know, if you look at somebody like Twitch on the outside, this man exuded positivity. You never saw him without a smile on his face. You couldn't watch those dance videos without feeling the ripple of joy. And for me personally, it reminds me of a really dear friend of mine that died from suicide over 10 years ago. And the second that I heard this news about somebody who on the outside looked like they were just doing great, it reminded me of losing somebody that was the same way. And that may be happening to you. And the other thing that this is bringing up for me is that you just have no clue what's going on in somebody else's life. You focus on the beautiful smile that somebody has or the great job or the bank account or the awesome spouse or the wonderful kids or the big house, but people don't live at their house. You know where everybody lives? They live inside their heads. And you and I don't have a clue what it's like for somebody else to live with the pain inside their heads. And so, you know, one of the major takeaways here for me is one of Twitch's biggest messages, which is being kind. And the fact that being kind and being positive around other people, you have no clue. In fact, we underestimate the impact that it can have on somebody else's life to just be kind to them. And so that's one takeaway, that you just don't have a clue. So please just don't assume that you know what's going on and assume that everybody is silently battling something. So it's on all of us to be kind to one another. Second thing that I want to say is I need you to be kind to yourself today because there's a lot swirling around right now. And so if you notice that you're thinking about people that you lost, which I am, I mean, yesterday, what was happening for me as I heard the news, and I, of course, immediately thought about his family is I was transported back to the day that I learned that our dear friend Fred had died from suicide. And it's like I started reliving that day again. 
as I thought about the pain that Twitch's wife, Allison, and his three kids were feeling, I thought about this particular moment on the day that Fred died, where I was with his daughter and we were walking up the front steps to his house. And I knew that when we opened that door, I was going to be present when she learned that her father had died. It is a moment that changed me forever. And so that's also what was happening for me yesterday. And I was thinking about, you know, how much I miss Fred. And I was thinking about how sad and heartbroken I am about all the other people in my life that had struggled with mental health issues and addiction or hopelessness or depression and how they all died from suicide and just how much pain there is out there. It can be really overwhelming. (sighs) If that's happening for you, just be kind to yourself. Like you may need to sleep in. You may need to go for a walk today. You should probably reach out to a friend and talk to somebody about it. It would be good for you to remember the person and, and the things that you miss about them. Like remembering somebody that is gone and, and thinking about the things that you really loved about them, that's a really healthy thing to do on a day like today. But simply being aware that news like this brings up stuff for you that's personal, that's step one. Step two is being kind to yourself. Step three is being proactive about taking care of yourself today and reaching out. And step four is understanding this issue in a larger context. And so now I want to kind of switch gears and address something that's pissing me off. As I see people processing Twitch's death in particular, because this hit me as hard as Robin Williams, as hard as Anthony Bourdain, and I think the reason why it hits people so hard is because you're trying to make sense of somebody who seems like they've got it all together on the outside. And it, in your rational mind, it just makes no sense. And that is where the learning is. See, your mind is rational right now. You're objective. You're not living with the pain the person was living with. So when you look at the situation from your lens, you remove the pain that the person was feeling. And so it makes no sense to your brain because your brain wasn't compromised from the mental health struggle that that person was really battling day in and day out. And so let me go back to the example of brain cancer. If you have a friend that's dying from brain cancer, you see them deteriorate on the outside. You see what's happening. You would never in a million years when somebody dies from brain cancer go, oh, that's so selfish. Why did they choose to do that? What about their family? But they had so many resources. But I see so many people writing this horse shit online and it's pissing me off because it shows that you don't have a freaking clue what it means to struggle with a mental health issue. You don't have a freaking clue. And it really pisses me off when I see people that write really arrogant pretentious things like, well, I struggled, I was in a dark thing, and I asked for help. Well, that's great. I'm happy that you didn't get so bad, that your brain wasn't so deteriorated, that you could ask for help. When somebody gets to the point that their brain functioning is so eroded that they cannot cognitively, rationally process the fact that there is a huge difference between ending the pain that you're dealing with and ending your life. When somebody gets to the point where they can't think clearly, it means the physical structure of their brain has deteriorated from the mental health battle. That's what that means. And that smile that people put on their faces the whole way through That is so hard. Can you imagine to get to the point where you love your family so much that you think the only way to save them is to get rid of yourself? Like this is just, that's how compromised your brain is. And so when I think about this like brain cancer, 
that the physical brain functioning is deteriorating to the point where nobody can think rationally. That removes all judgment. And all I have is compassion and sadness. That's it. That is it. And that is all there is to have for the people that you've lost, for the folks that we continue to lose, And for anybody that's listening to this, if this is you and you're in a really dark place right now, I want to speak directly to you right now. Because you're meant to hear this right now. You can address the pain that you're feeling in your mind and your body. You can. And there are people standing by right now that are trained that want to help you. And with support and with small tiny moves forward every single day, you can make this pain lessen, you can loosen the grip it has on you, and you can feel better. You can also improve the physical structure of your brain. You can improve the way that you think so that your brain starts to support you. You can face this with a little bit of support. You can. And you can do that, and I want you to do that because we want you here. You have a big, beautiful life, and I know that if you believe that you could somehow lessen the pain you're feeling, you would want to live that life. And so please, please, Please get support for the pain that you're feeling and hold on to the life that you have because your life is worth fighting for. And there are people that want to help you. We have resources in the show notes, not only for here in the United States, but also for multiple languages, international resources. And so I just felt the need to talk to you to check in with you. Um, Be kind to yourself today. Stop assuming that you know what other people are thinking. Remember the people that you've lost and the things that you loved about them. And um, together, we'll get through this. We will. I promise. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe.